Suicide and Forgiveness, the pod that shares the stories of those affected by suicide. Lost a loved one? Attempted it yourself? Did you know that when you share a burden, the load is lightened? Come listen in with your host, Elaine Lindsay. Suicide Zen Forgiveness, the podcast, is for education only. Some of the subject matter could be triggering for those that are newly grieving or in a poor state of mental health. Please call your local suicide hotline or mental health office if you need immediate help. Hello there. It's good to be back. Uh, it's ah, oh, it's almost the end of winter. Hallelujah. It's uh, something we should all be patting ourselves on the back for being able to have gotten through. Today, I have a guest that um, we, we might consider a little bit different from usual. Uh, we're going to be talking about grief and loss, chronic illness and pain and trauma. And my guest today is lovely Alison Byers. Alison is an associate marriage and family therapist. That's a AMFT in LA. And she's under the supervision of Pam Schaefer. Uh, she has a Master of Arts degree from Antioch University in clinical psychology with a specialization in psychological trauma. That really interests me. We're going to have some definite questions about that. Uh, she completed her traineeship at Didi Hirsch Jump Street, a crisis. A residential treatment program in Los Angeles where she worked with adult clients with severe mental health issues, including major depression, complex trauma, suicidal thoughts, borderline personality disorder, substance use issues, severe anxiety, and psychosis. This means that she really has a, a wide swath that she'll be able to discuss with us and take a good look at. And what I think is really, really cool, okay, Allison is a queer therapist who has chronic illness. And from that, she draws from her professional and her lived experiences. And for me, I think it's really important because I'm forever saying, if you're going to do something, if you're going to work with humans, you really need to sit in their place for a little bit so that you can truly understand what it's all about. Without further ado, I want to bring Allison out. Hi. Hello there. Hey. It's very good to have you with me today. Thank um, you. It's great bet. to be here. Great. I'm sure you have better weather than me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It is very nice here. <laughs> Yeah, LA definitely, definitely, for the most part, I would say you have way better weather. We're we're still snowing here, so uh, I'm, oh, I'm really probably more excited about spring than most people. <laughs> fair, fair, understand that. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to do, and I I like to really just make a conversation. So let's look at. I want to ask you what came first your training or your illness? Um, my illness came first. Um, I was first diagnosed with um, a condition called, it's a mouthful, hydrogenitis separativa. It's um, a skin disease that um, results in like abscesses all over the body. Um, yeah, it's very painful. Um, I was diagnosed my senior year of college. So I was... Um, just finishing up school, ready to like go into the real world and do everything that I was learning. Um, I was uh, a journalism major. And so I wanted to go be a broadcast yeah. reporter. Um, yeah. And just, I, I realized I was doing an internship and I just couldn't, I couldn't carry the camera equipment. I had just a hard time working those long hours. Um, and so I yeah I took some time off moved back home with my parents and just um just kind of reevaluated things oh that had that had to be so tough because that's yeah it's just your introduction to the whole uh, world as an adult 
oh my god yeah just yeah. the the mind games that we play with ourselves it, it, that had to be quite the burden yeah yeah i went to a pretty dark place um mm. and um I had struggled depression for, for through my teenage years and for a long time, but it was kind of then when I really started first having some suicidal thoughts and some really tough, um, tough, dark thoughts about just the future and what life held for me. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I like to always stress it's, it's very often not that we don't want to live anymore. It's that we don't want to be in pain anymore, whatever kind of pain yes. that's. And from that place, did you reach out at home? Did you reach out to a therapist? What was it that gave you the impetus to basically put a hand out and ask for help? Yeah. So I actually, um, therapy is not, I'm from the Midwest, from Wisconsin. Therapy is still not a thing <laughs> there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, yeah. So it was really kind of like, you know, my parents were very supportive, but they kind of were like, all right, you got to find a new career path. We got to find something else that's going to. Um, so it's it's kind of wild. I I moved to Chicago with some friends, just kind of worked and, and tried to see doctors in Chicago and try and just get some good medical treatment for my illnesses. Um, and then I... Um, I just, I've always wanted to live in California in Los Angeles. And so I just packed my bags and I moved out here. I figured like, you know, what do I have to lose? And, um, the weather's great and maybe it would help my, would have helped my illnesses. They had a really great, um, specialty clinic out here for hydronitis. So I, I just kind of packed my bags and decided to try it in the entertainment industry. And looking back, wow. I, mean, I, went, <laughs> I went to go to an industry where there's, insane working hours but um but I just I was like I can't live like I just can't live like this anymore and I can't live without doing anything and oh, then it's here when I got here this is like when I found a therapist because everyone in LA sees a therapist and so <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> got it uh, and I do find as someone that's dealt with chronic illness we can't do things all the time, but it's amazing how much you can do when it's something you really, really want. And yeah. it's not always the best thing you can do for yourself, is it? When you push yeah. yourself too hard, that can be a real issue too. Yes, yes. I have burned out of jobs. I mean, I've just, I've left many jobs yeah. because of just getting too sick and um and I think um yeah something I also really learned is having a you know having doctors and a team that really supports you and is there to like have ideas with treatments and just opens the doors to have a, a medical team too that can really like help with treatment options and is just there um, I have a great team too that's just really supportive of the mental health aspects too of it and understands that there is such a, I mean, it affects your mental health and vice versa. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like everything in our bodies, it are, it's truly integrated. You know, if, yeah. if you, if you have a pain somewhere, it, it is going to affect other areas of your body. And quite often pain shows up in other places from where the problem actually is. Yep. Yeah. So you, you found yourself a therapist and did the first one, was the first one a good fit? <laughs> um, yes. Yes. She was a really good fit um, for, for a long time. Um, and then um it, things got, yeah, it, it ended up not being a good fit after about four years. Um, and then I, I found someone new who is now a really wonderful fit. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it was that first therapist that really, um, really inspired me to go back to school and become a therapist myself. It was that experience oh, wow. that inspired me to do the same. So I had to give her credit for that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and what a, what a detour from journalism uh, yeah. Rather, rather than yeah, rather than being the, 
the one, well, uh, actually, in, in some funny ways, it's not, actually. It's just a little more specific, right? Because you're looking at the stories of others. You're just, you're no longer just recording them. You're actually working with them. I, I don't have a better term, but you're working with the individual to change the story. As a reporter, you're just the facts. Yeah, yeah. And I'm able to sit with people now and sit with people in their pain. And I actually have kind of a full circle. I was I was doing an internship in, um, yeah, it was my senior year of college. It was in a small town in Wisconsin. And um, there had been this like awful car crash that had happened. And I was sent out to go report on it. And it's kind of my big story. It was supposed to be like kind of the big, <laughs> the big story that I've been waiting for my entire internship. And um, I got there and I just, you know, there were, there were um, fatalities and I just couldn't, I just didn't want to stick a camera in their face and ask them, how are you doing? You know, of course it was pretty obvious, like how they were, how they were feeling. And um, I came back with like no footage and I got in huge trouble and it was kind of like a wake up call though of like, this is not, I don't know if this is actually what I want to do either. There's something missing here. And then, you know, finding, finding therapy. I was like, this is what's missing. I get to actually sit with those people and, and be in their pain. I'm not trying to fix it. I'm not trying to come up with solutions, but just sitting there and letting, witnessing their stories is just some, that was, that was the missing moment that I've been just found now. Well, and absolutely. And, and that's exactly what I want to do here because sharing your story lightens your burden and it really, really does. And, and yes. that yeah, therapy, I think, is just a much deeper, bigger version of that. Yeah. I also think perhaps you were a little too empathetic to just be a reporter. And, and I don't mean that I'm, I'm not in any way denigrating reporters because they are critical to us. But you have to be able to build a certain distance between yourself mm -hmm. as a reporter and the people that, that are in crisis. Um, you couldn't do it for long if you didn't. I just think it's unfortunate when you see a lot of reporters, those first couple of questions are often so inane. It, it's like, you know, come on, you, you see what's going on. Give the viewer something to be more empathetic about. Yeah. But, I mean, that that's we could do a whole show just on that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting though, something I've learned is just, just starting out as a trauma therapist, especially is like how to, in this line of work too, how to be there with the client and listen to their story and really be there, but also not have it like overtake me where then I can't, like I'm getting vicarious trauma, which is like, I'm starting to carry their stories or I'm starting to find. And again, it's like the kind of this don't want to not detach is not, that's a very like clinical, I don't not detach, yeah. but like just be in there, but also kind of step back then and also be able to um, go home and take care of myself and and come back. And so I can do the work for a long time and not get overloaded with things as well. Because I hear some pretty yeah, it's, awful stories. Yeah, it's it's like yeah. um, giving yourself a little breathing room. Yeah. So that you yeah. can be of service. Yeah, it's hard when this work, I mean, you're doing this this podcast, it's hard to be in this work all the time. And yeah. Um, continue to pour from that pour from your cup absolutely and and I think in a way and and I, I don't know if you agree but being chronically ill and living in pain 24 7 it gives you a better opportunity to carry your empathy with you and still be of service because after the fact or late in your journey, you're able to understand that you have to give yourself that breathing room in order to be of any use to anyone else. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree. It's, uh, it, it's, it's incredible the work you do. And, and again, I, I, I was talking to you before we came on. I, 
I think it's incredibly important for therapists, for doctors, for nurses, uh, dentists, anyone that has the ability to inflict pain, not intentionally, needs to understand what it is on the other side so that they can be mindful when they're working with people because I, I don't know how much time you, you spent in hospital or being tested or what have you. Uh, it can become very, um, the people can become guinea pigs. And, and I don't want to say guinea pig because they have feelings too. But for young residents and teaching students in the medical field, they can lose sight of the fact that, that this person before you is a person they're not just your test subject and and that I think uh, is something that we don't spend enough time educating on and I don't know what it's like in the therapy field but I think empathy is something that we have to explore if we're going to work with other human beings yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, you know, it's um, a couple of things that come to mind is one is I, yeah, I'm really passionate actually about working with people with medical trauma. And I think we think of medical trauma as these like big, um, you know, like had a life, you know, life threatening surgery, or, you know, they messed up on something or, and those, of course, are traumas, but also just these kind of more, I don't like to say little traumas, so that's minimizing, but these more chronic traumas of like, being dismissed by doctors, yeah, being just poked and prodded and not looked at, and fat phobia, like going to doctors that are harmful or therapists that are harmful. Like, you know, I I was harmed by a therapist like very intensely and like it now affects, I work with clients who have been harmed by other mental health professionals or hospital state hospitalizations, especially psychiatric hospitalizations that are like, yes, maybe your life was saved, but also it caused a lot of trauma and just these these um, institutions that can be harmful and can cause trauma there. It's a big, big passion of mine. Um, I'm, I'm glad, I'm really glad to hear that because it is almost in those little things. And I don't, they're not little for the person that's suffering through it, but for someone to go to a doctor because they, deep inside know there's something wrong and be consistently told, nah, nah, just go home, just go home. Mm-hmm. Or, or yeah, um, not, not just fat phobia, but there are so many ways. Oh, good. It wasn't mine. <laughs> no, it is mine. I have a little dog. <laughs> yeah, me too. Tiny. Um, the, the concept of, being dismissed it speaks to humans deepest need to be seen and heard and when you're already in pain even if it's mental pain that can be kind of the last straw when when they just don't take you seriously and it's not even a matter of, of getting gaslighted it's a matter of beginning to doubt oneself and the more it happens the more doubt there is and and I know I know that can contribute to the statistics that I deal with all the time here but it's it's got to be a really big part for a therapist uh, to have you know patients that that have been basically you know poo-pooed away or Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's not a big deal. Or or in the case of, of trauma or and chronic illness is oh yeah, yeah, just just you know, buck up, uh, mm-hmm. suffer through it. It's there are people worse than you. That kind of dismissive attitude, sadly, is still out there. Yeah, yeah. In, Definitely. In terms of patience. And, you know, it's hard to generalize, I get that. But in terms of standing up for oneself, whether whether it's medical or an authority or, or a family member or someone who is not taking your concerns or your pain or whatever seriously, 
what are some sort of general things that people can do to protect themselves within those interactions? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I would say, you know, setting boundaries is a big thing of like, you know, I will not have conversations about this or this is, you know, we're not talking about this. Um, I always give clients to, I'm like, here's some, they want to educate themselves on something more than here's, you know, have a list of educational, like what it's like living with depression or whatever it may be. And, yeah. you know, say, this is how you can, if you want to read about this, you know, if it's someone who truly does care and wants to understand, but just isn't getting it. Um, because it's hard to provide that emotional labor of, you know, explaining to someone what it's like living with your, your, yeah. whatever physical or mental illness. And, um, also just fine. I think community is so important. Like, you know, whether it's in the chronic illness, whether it's mental or physical, it's finding community and online people who, um, just are, can get it, you know, other people who yeah. live with chronic illness, yeah. Um, my social media feeds now are just filled with either therapists or, or people living with like chronic illness or people with lived experience in different areas. And just, um, yeah, just seeing those, just that, just seeing those videos and photos just reminds me of like other people are going through this. And um, yeah. there's also some really great Facebook groups for every type of illness out there, you know, and so it's oh. like joining those groups. Um, people are just, yeah, even people will join and say like, hey, I'm not sure if I have this, I'm not getting this diagnosis, yeah. but this is what I'm experiencing. And just that validation, I mean, if you aren't able, you're still trying to get that diagnosis, this can be so yeah. helpful. Um, and um, yeah, I think just community is so important with any of these things, just having, having a sense of community is, is so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. We all need a tribe. We all yeah. need a tribe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Are you, um, I'm finding in the past, I'm going to say, six or seven years there are more people that are more open to learning about the chronic illnesses to learning about mental health issues that people uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis way more so than ever before you know people used to be quite dismissive and and not just within a workplace or, or management or what have you, you know, leadership still needs to go a long, long way, especially in the corporate world. But people and, and more young men as well are starting to understand that you can't just keep it inside. You, you need to talk to someone else. Uh, whatever your issue may be. And are you seeing like more younger people coming for help? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think it's a lot more, it's hard because I know living in Los Angeles, it's already so <laughs> much more open here than other places. So I, yeah. I sometimes like, yeah. I feel like I live in a bubble a little bit where it is so talked about here. Um, but even going back to, you know, when I go back home to Wisconsin, like, you know, my, I've, you know, friends from home or family members who are going to therapy who I never thought in a million years would ever yeah. <laughs> go yeah. talk to somebody. And um, so I think, I think it is getting better. Um, and I, you know, I know in like the mental health world, there is conversations around like, you know, TikTok and Instagram and like if they're yeah. helpful or if they're people are over diagnosing themselves or over identifying things. And I'm just like access is hard to get sometimes to a therapist. And so if people are finding mm -hmm. that like able to look at something and go like, wow, I have those similar symptoms or I, I relate to this a lot. And maybe this is something that's going on. It gets them to go reach out for help. I'm all for that. And um, I think it's, you know, we can, and yeah, I even think us being out there on social media too and providing psychoeducational content on this stuff too, is helping people realize like, you know, oh, I, I'm not, don't have to live in shame with this. I can go talk to somebody. And yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm really passionate about some of those feel like suicidal thoughts and suicidality is something that a lot of therapists still really shy away from. And I'm yeah. like, you know, we have to talk about these things. Borderline personality disorder is a very yeah. stigmatized yeah. diagnosis that, oh you God, know, yeah. 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 inside the community too, but it's so important to talk well, about. These things absolutely. And, and um, with it being international women's month and this being week or last week, I was at a number of events and they're all to do with mental health. 
uh, one in particular for the, the main psychiatric hospital here in town was Every Woman Counts. And it had to do with mental health. And a lot of women in the community came together and created a group for women's mental health. And they have a foundation and they do all kinds of work, which is phenomenal because, wow, yeah, yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. And it's so, uh, it's so touching to see millennials and the younger people understanding that it's not just about you alone. Like you have to get together with others and you have to try and uplift others. And it was, it was very different when I was young. We, we were, the stigma was prevalent, maybe way more prevalent than it is now. There were, I did a volunteer work in a, a facility. It wasn't psychiatric. It was uh, for people that were mentally challenged and it became sort of the last ditch drop-off point for anything from someone who didn't have any family uh, to someone who was, had a mental deficit to, uh, in one case, a young boy uh, who was a runaway. And um, he was a runaway because his home was abusive. And he'd run away so many times. I was working for a summer there and I came upon him in a one of the wings. It was a giant place. And I said, oh, wow, you're working here too? And he said, no, I live here now. And it literally put me in a state of total fear. Because in my head, you could be put away for anything. So if you had a suicidal thought or, or even a thought that, maybe you thought was a little crazy, you better not put it out there because yeah. that's where you were going to end up. And it just made the silence and the stigma and that shame, this huge rolling boulder that took on its own life. And I talked to other people from that year, friends from school, and they all basically said the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was you didn't dare say that we even our parents came from you don't air your dirty laundry in public you you don't say anything my my aunt my father's only sister uh was abused by her husband mm -hmm. and it was not well known she died when i was seven and we didn't know how she died, or to this day, we're still not quite sure. I know it was not a, it was not an easy or an expected death because she was not very old. Yeah. But when I talk to people, they all have similar stories. You don't talk about that. You didn't put that out there. Oh, our family didn't discuss X, Y, Z, and there were people who were in the medical field. I have friends that are therapists and, but it was not something that you trumpeted. And uh, one therapist that I spoke to the other day, she was saying that it used to be funny because when you saw a patient in public, you had to avert your eyes and, and certainly not pretend that you knew them. And lately, uh, she had seen a couple of patients who were waving in you. Hi, that's that's my therapist. It's just such it's just <laughs> such a, a different attitude and that openness. I want to see us permeate everything to do with mental health and suicidal ideation and all of those things. And I want to ask you, what do you think about? Getting the information to children, young children. I think if you're in elementary school, you need to understand that every thought that runs through your head is not real, nor is it right, 
nor does it reflect on you as a person. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. My mom's the elementary school teacher, and um, we have conversations a lot about mental health. And it's like, kids will say something, you know, of and like, you know, uh, you know, this is so this day was so hard, I just want to kill myself. And then it's like, yeah. you know, my mom has to like, make her call, make her report, and this whole big thing happens. And it's like, and it, I'm sure, you know, it sends a message of like, you know, if you say this, we're gonna have this whole big yeah. thing has to happen and it just I was like I wish there was more conversations around and they'd still just have like you know the like they're, they don't have conversations about anxiety no. and depression I think about no. like growing up with anxiety it was looked at as like yay you're doing you want to do so good in school and it was like no I'm, I was paralyzed inside with just yes. fear and like it's I wish there was just more conversations around these things or like hey what do you mean when you say you're having a really bad day you want to kill yourself what, what's going on here like what's the yeah. what are the emotions underneath and it's like um and then they make these calls and everyone comes and then nothing happens you know nothing gets followed up on and then you know yeah. the kid's still suffering there's something going on where they're saying that and yeah just depression too my mom and I talk a lot about just that kids are suffering and they're like you know yeah. they're not able to have places to talk and um especially I think you know in in California here I think more parents are more willing to um, I work with yeah. their teens. And they're more willing to put yeah. kids in, the, some, but like still outside of the big cities, I think there's not this, that's not really happening no. as much. And, no. um, and, and you're seeing children getting bullied as young as nine and yeah. 10. And, and yeah. it, it's not outside the realm. Children have died. We mm -hmm. don't see it as much because the families are still covering it up. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a horrible thought. Um, I don't know if, if it was last week. I don't remember what I was seeing. Uh, they were interviewing some celebrities or something. I just happened to catch the tail end of whatever was being said. And the one of the women said, oh, I, I could just kill myself. That was such a blah, blah, blah. And it was something very trivial. And I thought, you know, that's not, that's not a statement we should use. Mm -hmm. It's not something we want to put out there. And it's definitely not something we want celebrities putting out there. Because children still follow the crowd. They still want to be like their, their heroes and, and sheroes and, and what have you. And I think it's, I think it's important. I, I, I believe comedy solves a number of things and keeps us all going. And, and I'm not saying you can't say anything. What I'm saying is we need to open conversation early enough that even children will understand someone was making a joke. It's not a good joke. It's not a good thing to say, but it's not, it's not meant. It's not, it's not something you should act upon or if you have that kind of thought, it's not something that you should be following. You should tell someone, not, you know, just throw it out there. I don't have, I don't have a roadmap for, for what I'm suggesting. And I'm probably going to talk to everybody on the planet if I can, because somebody needs to start the chat wherever you are and let's move it along so that we can save more people. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I did um, for part of my traineeship, I went, we had to do um, go to a local like boys and girls club and we talked to them about, um, we did different presentations for the different age ranges. And we talked about like emotions and how to regulate your emotions, what to do when you're angry and um, it was amazing. This this yeah local boys and girls club put on mental health presentations every mm -hmm. every month for the kids and um, yeah and they had their little toolbox and we like helped them build new tools mm -hmm. around like you know when you're angry you don't go and punch somebody or you yeah. need, how do you use your words how do you tell somebody how do you express mm -hmm. what you're feeling and 
um, it was so great. And I wish that existed for every, every kid to be able to get those tools and get that conversation. They were interested. They wanted to learn and understand. Yeah. And, like, play, um, let's learn this stuff. And a lot of them had some really like big feelings that were happening, like, especially in this area it was low income and oh, like, yeah. their parents, you know, their parents yeah. had never learned how to like regulate their emotions. And so yeah. They just, they were like, I don't know how to, do, I don't know what to do with this. And kids are, I mean, I couldn't imagine. I mean, I grew up like with a little bit of social media, but I cannot imagine even today, like growing up with like all the stuff on social media and it's oh, like, yeah, a lot of great things social media does, but also for kids, it's like, I can just not, imagine, just, just uh, all the I filters and all the, yeah. like, I can't yeah. even imagine had there been social yeah. media when my crew were in school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bowling, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, yeah. It, it's truly frightening. And yeah, for kids, tool, I think this is wonderful. These, and a lot of the tools are virtual. Okay, mindfulness and little meditations mm -hmm. and visualizations that, that can help you bring those emotions down. Because, yeah, emotions are terrifying. Okay, yeah, even, yeah. even at the ripe old age of 67, there are some emotions that come and it's like, oh my God, what do I do with that? And yeah, yeah and, you know, we, we've never had a way to deal with those things. School is, is great for learning to interact with others, but we don't teach the basic, most important things that we as humans need to learn. Yeah. You know, yes, I'm, I'm not knocking geography and history and all of those things are definitely important. But how, how about, you know, the basics for little kids of how to handle your emotions, how to handle problems with your parents? Yeah. There's a lot of kids, we don't see what's going on in their home. And, and yeah. if you're a kid and that's all you know, you think that's normal. And sorry, yeah. I hate that word normal, but you think that's the regular activity in most households. Yes. Because yeah, no one, I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I have, I have so many adult clients who come and they just feel so ashamed of like how they have operated or how things have been and they feel so much they feel like you know I'm, I'm broke I hear so much like I broke it and my brain is broken I am like not um I, why am I not functioning at the level other people are functioning first of all we talk about like what does that mean what does normal functioning really look like yeah. it's the first conversation but also it's like hey you didn't learn these things like these are learned skills and you didn't yeah. learn them or you got messaging that like you know a lot of my clients get messaging of like I was not allowed to feel emotions like that was not something Ooh. like expressing anger feeling sad like you you put that away kind of you said earlier too like you don't air your dirty laundry you don't feel these you power through and you, you move forward and so a lot of them don't even know how to we work I'll bring out like a feelings wheel and some are just so overwhelmed with like all the feelings on the feelings wheel <laughs> and we'll just yeah. spend time talking about them and they every session I start off with they have to pick um, two emotions from the feelings wheel and um, they can't say I'm good I'm fine I'm okay has to pick something from there and we just start learning how to, yeah how to identify emotions um, and something I you know I think I'm other therapists maybe are not like this necessarily but I'm a little bit more like I self-disclose a little more like I'll also pick my feelings off the feelings wheel and go like hey I'm having a really hard you know I'm having a hard day but I did this you know coping tool and I'm here now. I'm excited to be here with you and we're going to, you know, do some work or, but I also don't use like, I'm, I'm good or I'm okay or I'm fine. Um, I really try and, you know, stay away from those things too, because they're not really how we feel. Well, no, it's such a band-aid. Yeah. <laughs> it is, instead of saying I'm fine or just hand somebody a band-aid because that's about what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of clients do like a lot of people never really get, I mean, we always ask, how are you to people? Right. But we don't really care. I mean, a lot of people don't necessarily we, care. We right. don't even wait for the answer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's like a lot of clients find when they come, they're like, Oh, someone wants to know how I am. And they actually care what the answer is and why. And um, that's yeah. new for, for some people. And, and that, what you offer that, that being, letting them be seen and be heard 
I think that's the greatest gift in the world. And if we could just learn to do that from the get-go for the children, it would be a lot easier. But we don't come with a handbook, okay? Mm -hmm. None of us did. And no, none of us are perfect. And, And I, you know, part of my little crusade here, and none of us are normal, okay? We might be regular, we might kind of fit in, but no, I, I want to be Abby normal. I want to be me because yeah. if everybody was exactly the same, why would there be an everybody? <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. That just makes no sense to me. It's like, yeah. no, no, there's got to be color, flavor. Would you eat the same piece of square piece of nothingness day in and day out if it had no flavor yeah no how would you get a kid to eat that there's just (laughs) no way yeah so so why yeah why do we want to be bland or you know flavorless i think it's important and i think it's important for us to understand that everybody I don't care who they are. I don't care how disabled they are. I don't care how gifted they may be. Everybody has one thing that they do spectacularly. One thing that that they can hold as their own little special thing. And I think it's important, and I always told my kids, it was important to understand that although you can, in the case of my son, was fabulous at math as a little kid, and his sister was not, and she was nine years older than him, and he was being very mean to her one day, and I said, listen, you, okay, this is how it is, and everybody has a talent, and your sister is an artist. And you can't draw a stick figure. So do you want her to make fun of you about that? He, he was a yeah. bit of a precocious child. So did, <laughs> did not like that. But I think it's important for people to understand that, yeah, just because we don't do it the same way, just because you and I don't part our hair on the same side or wear the same color, it doesn't mean we don't have all the same feelings. We don't have all the same internal bits that keep us chugging along. So those similarities are there, I think, to support the differences. So we can find others interesting. Yeah, yeah, such a good point. And... (laughs) I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I love it. You have good points. You're very easy to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. I I think it's it's incredibly important. I think it's wonderful that you you recognize that you're in LA, so you have a much more uh, open uh, group of people that understand how important these things are. How do we get that to permeate through the small towns and and all the little places so that people understand, you know, it's an old, old adage, but it really does take a village. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even it's so interesting, even my mom who she knows, I mean, we talk very openly about my career and like she knows all about therapy and stuff even she um she went through breast cancer and even like during that i was like you should really see a therapist like this is a really big thing to be going through um and she was like i don't want to talk about my childhood and i was like no one's gonna make you talk about your childhood you can go and just talk present i was like we're not like us therapists are not like you know and if someone's gonna try and force you to talk about your childhood you don't want to go find another therapist (laughs) someone else I was just like, you are in control of what you can talk and not talk about. It's okay. Like, 
Um, and so just a very like, yeah, it's still this idea of like, oh, a therapist is going to make me go back and talk about my childhood. Yeah. And they're going to say all my problems are because of childhood. Um, yeah. And it's it's like, um, you know, I wish there was more education around like there's so many different types of therapy. There's so many different yeah. Yeah. types of therapists. Like there's so many you can go for short term things just for, you know, if you just going through a difficult time. Um, and I think too, this, there's a lot of times people feel like, well, I'm going to be in therapy forever. And it's like, no, most people come. I mean, I have some clients who after six months or even a few months, they're, they're okay. They're ready to go back and they may come back once a month for maintenance sessions, or they may come back, you know, when things get, you know, difficult again, but, um, you're not stuck doing this forever. Um, and I think too, another, I mean, it's hard because it's, there's like, which I can, I'll keep brief because I can go into a whole soapbox on this of like accessibility, okay. you know, it's, <laughs> um, there, you know, therapists have to be, so it's, I think a lot of people don't also understand some of the intricacies of like, we have to be licensed in the state we live in. So there's like just a lack of, I mean, in LA alone, there's, you know, thousands of therapists. There's so many of us. It's a very saturated environment. Um, but in like, you know, I look at Wisconsin, there's not as many therapists in the rural areas. There's, I mean, I hope telehealth is helping things a lot, yes. you know, being able to see clients throughout the state, but even still, I think there's just a lot of therapists don't live in some States and they're kind of, you know, there's a ton in California and there's a lot of clients here, but um, I'm hoping to, they're working on legislation to allow for, um, therapists to get more easily licensed in other states or if a client because I've even if one of my clients travels for just a couple weeks like I cannot see them while they're traveling which wow. feels yeah they have to be physically in California so there's just oh, a I lot of know that. yeah some therapists will do it but it technically is not it's yeah um uh, you know and so it's hard and if sometimes my clients are traveling that's when they're having they're going back to family they're going I mean they're going to some big things are going to yeah. come up and so it's hard so I, I'm hoping that they start to pass these more um laws where you can you can be easily in other states or you can see clients throughout if they're traveling yeah. um but there's just a lot yeah and I think too accessibility in terms of um like insurance you know it's it's yes. um it's really hard I don't take insurance um partially because my supervisor does not take insurance but um we have these conversations a lot where it's like reimbursement is really low for insurance companies and it takes you spend hours unpaid every week trying to get mm -hmm. paid trying to get those claims and stuff and then yeah. also like they have to you know I have some clients who are coming for they're not necessarily have like diagnosable things they're just coming because they're having some relationship difficulties or things like that and insurance won't cover that and then I have to try and like mm -hmm. make up or try and like fit them in some diagnosis yeah. which was really so it's it's there's just a lot of that too and insurance panels are insurance companies really prioritize like big um therapy groups uh, yeah um yeah uh, and so like us little like sole like private practice people have a hard time it takes sometimes it takes like six months to a year to even get paneled wow. with insurance so even if i want to take it i have to like yeah, wait a very long time yeah, that's, so it's, that's it's a lot yeah, yeah. It's not as simple as like, I'll just take insurance. There's a lot that goes into it too. And looking at it. And um, I wish it was more like, you know, for me, I'm, when I get licensed, I plan to have a few, like very low income slots for people who, you know, for 20 bucks or that sort of thing to do. Um, and it's hard being an associate as well. It's 50% of my income goes to my supervisor. So she takes 50% of my fees for giving me I work under her license. And you know, okay. this is very standard. Like this is a very standard rate. Um, but it's hard. Like I can't charge if I charge 20 bucks, I'm like gonna get ten dollars. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's so not gonna work. Yeah, so there's a lot of that goes in that conversation too around just accessibility and needing to have a big change in oh our my God. yeah. Well policies too. Yeah, another thing that that for me, just as a lay person who kind of looking at the big picture. I would like us to to change to a proactive system for health yes. and wellness and mental health has to be part of that. Because if you, yes. you know, and, and that's why I started with like having the children understand in the silence while also if you, you, you know, you're not quite sure how you're feeling, if you nip it in the bud or if you already 
have seen a therapist who's given you tools just to live your life with, you may not have to go see them for something horrific because you were armed with the tools you needed. And, and I yeah. think the same for health. We've always been backwards in the Western world. Oh, you don't yes. go to the doctor until, uh, you know, your arm's falling off or <laughs> some cases. Yeah, many things are yeah. falling off. Yeah, we, yeah. Don't, we don't do that. It's not prevention. And, and it's proven in the other countries that start with prevention. On average, the health costs are an awful lot less. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, you're not getting so far gone that you need extreme measures. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah especially, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Or even with trauma, too. It's like, I love, I mean, I definitely want to, I'm passionate about in the future. I want to volunteer for the Red Cross and go to, like, disaster zones because a lot of that is like trying to just kind of nip it in the bud with people right away of like here's your yeah. here's some coping tools and a lot of people will be they'll be okay like they will use yeah. their tools they'll go through hard time but it will they will be okay and when like but it, there it's like really trying to get there and give education around like these are signs these are things to look out for yeah. um yeah I wish we did I wish we I wish we did that more of just you know um I talk a lot in my groups that I run at, like, I work at a treatment center. We talk a lot about, like, what are warning signs for depression? What are signs that, like, maybe your yeah. depression or anxiety or, like, you know, bipolar disorder is getting worse? What are you going to do when that happens? Like, who, you you know, who are you going to reach out to? What's going to be and just a lot of conversations around preventing it from getting to, like, a crisis level where then it's, um, yeah, because, yeah, it's, yeah, and I feel, I feel for people who are in crisis and they're trying to find a therapist and can't find someone or there's oh, wait yeah. lists, like, it's just really, um, but I get, you know, I understand people don't want to pay for this stuff if nothing's, nothing's yeah. going wrong yet. And I understand that that's a, that's a, you know, yeah. thing, but, I, but I wish we were. You pay running. insurance. You yes. pay health insurance. You pay car insurance. You pay you insurance. Yeah. Why don't you pay yourself yeah. insurance? We do it yeah. for our pets. Yeah. You know, and, and putting together and in, in what you were saying there, having a plan. Okay, just just as a person, not not because you have an issue, but just having a plan in the event that something happens, you know, here here are some tools. And everybody now, I believe, has heard of meditation and visualization. Those are tools that it's easy to arm ourselves with and they don't cost anything. But yeah. having a, you know, putting together for me, I think it starts with even uh, the people that are coming into a, to the same countries as us. I was an immigrant. We we came with what we had on our back and one little box of dishes that the train, when we got to this country, the, the guy running the train said to my father, oh, that can't come on the train. It says fragile. And my dad said, Oh, just give me a minute. And he went and got him a pen and scratched out fragile because it was all we had. Oh <laughs> Luckily, they, they made it here. But if we had a little booklet or something that maybe we give to kids as they start school and start them on a path to understanding, you know, here are the emotions we have. Here's what you can do with them. Look in your little plan. And for little kids, it could just be pictures about med. Kids are very open to meditation and visualization. Yeah. They have imaginations that are wonderful. But I, I think I think it's a, a really good idea to start something so that people have a reference guide. When I grew up, yeah. we had encyclopedias, like tons of them. We we have the internet for the most part. But, but having something that's intrinsically about you for you and, and is there to keep you well, I think it's really important. And, and yeah. that was a really good suggestion. That was an excellent suggestion, Allison. I love it. Yeah. That. I, I know. It even got me thinking on this, on this uh, right now talking of like some kind of even workshop for low fee workshop for people to come and like. Hey, you're not, maybe you're not, you know, maybe you're doing pretty good, but if yes. like something 
kind of prep for what if, you know, we're going to go through grief, we're going to go through hard times, things are going to happen, like, yeah, life is going to become difficult. And how are you going to get through that? Or how are you going to um, move through that? So I think that's yeah, I remember there's a yeah. therapist actually, I went to a local, um, uh, I had a, a friend went to a local um, neighborhood kind of festival thing. And she said she there was a therapist there who had a booth at the festival and she just like people could sign up just to talk to her for 10 yeah. 15 minutes and learn about what is therapy what do you do what and like she would just give some yeah she just gave some like resources and was there just to kind of like destigmatize like therapy and what it was all about and it was, it was a more lower income community and so it was probably people who yeah. hadn't really thought of therapy and um i was like that's such a great that's such a cool idea to go into the community and i think that's brilliant one yeah. Well, yeah. Just think about it, okay? If you go to buy a wedding dress, they have little booklets for how you yeah. how you get a wedding planner, how you set up the tables, how you send invitations. There's a how to for so many things. Why don't we yeah. make a how to for us? Yeah. I have an idea. Here. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's way down the road and and if this conversation sparks something somewhere uh, i just i think it would be wonderful because i firmly believe every bit of knowledge that you can arm yourself with is vital in making sure that you can live your happiest life because happiness isn't something that smacks you in the head it's something you have to work on yes yeah you know? and it's not up to the people around us it's not up to our therapists it's not up to our uh, rabbis or or priests or or padres or, or you know pastors or what have you it is up to you to make that choice yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's it's interesting because too, because I I mean I I'm very much like I will I'm I'm self disclose with clients more than probably other therapists do because I really value I, I think sharing myself is like we're two humans in a room. Like yes, I'm a therapist, <laughs> but we are two humans in a room. And I really, especially someone who's you know, someone I'm someone who is very open about my chronic suicide ideation. Like I have yeah. had suicidal thoughts on and off for 16 years and there's something I Remember. just have kind of to live with. Yeah. They're just, they probably yeah. will be around for a long time. Um, and um, yeah, I think a lot of people think like, Oh, you're a therapist. You must, you know, you don't struggle with this stuff. You're happy all the time. Like, yeah. Nope. I struggle with this all the time, but now they're little, they're blips that come in and I'm able to like manage them and, and have a plan yeah. and like, you know, they kind of come and go and um, but I'm like, I still have moments of joy and happiness and all these, yeah, you know, yeah. more positive emotions, but also I have hard days. We have our days. And sometimes I think, yeah, people yeah. think mental wellness is being happy all the time. And something we talk about at our treatment center is like really educating people on like, just like physical health. You're going to have like pain. You're going to have, you know, difficult, yeah. challenging emotions. You're going to have periods of time where things just are tough and that's okay. It doesn't mean yeah. there's something you it's part of life but learning how to cope with that is is important and and part of that is the fact that humans by nature are comparative so we can't know that we're happy unless we've been sad yeah we, we don't know somebody's tall unless you've seen someone who's short that would be me uh, <laughs> We, we are comparative in everything. It is human nature. Yeah. So, such a good you know, going through all of those emotions, the one thing that we need to understand is that emotions are meant to flow and go. They're passing. Okay. And I think the longest I've heard now is three minutes. The average emotion lasts 90 seconds like, to yeah. three minutes. Yeah. Once you know that's another tool for your toolbox. Is if you can make it through those three minutes or 90 seconds, then you can move on to a better emotion. And it won't always be happiness. 
but you have the choice to kind of move it up the scale towards something better, no matter what's going on. And I, I will hearken back to Viktor Frankl in that because if you can find happiness in a concentration camp because it's your choice, then we surely should be able to do a little something ourselves if we have those guides. Yeah, yeah. I talk a lot about, too, about with the clients, I talk a lot about small wins. I'm like, just yes. looking throughout your day of like, hey, you got out of bed this morning, even though depression wanted you to stay in bed all day. Great. You made it to the couch. Awesome. That is that is a win. Like, you know, you went, got out of bed for 30 minutes and then went back in it. All right. You got out of bed for 30 minutes. Like, yeah. Really. Yeah. Really reminding clients too of like these, these moments of joy, or I call them pockets of joy too, or pockets of openness yeah. are going to be, they're going to be really little when you're really battling like, you know, severe depression or severe anxiety, oh, yeah. but they're there. Like that's still reminders that like the depression lets up for a little bit, just for a second and it comes back. But yeah they're there no matter what and we have to just like hold on to those little moments and and accept that like we're gonna get out of this and this is gonna get better at some point and if if you can write them down it gives you something to go back and go over and realize well okay I thought you know Monday was really really bad but oh look at all these little bits of joy as you say so yeah it wasn't as bad as I thought yeah. Yeah. And every little bit helps, right? Every little and thing that, that you can do. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we've just made everything right with the world. Um, <laughs> you know, there we go. How do we get that out there? Someone, someone do this plan because I have too many ideas and not enough time for plans. So, oh, Well, yeah, but they're really good ideas. <laughs> um, and, and the fact is that right. we're you know, we're, we're kind of being a little flip about this, but someone somewhere may see this and somebody else may run with it. And, you know, all the good ideas eventually come to fruition. Yes. Yes. So for me, I, I think that's, I think that's a big win. Yes. Yes. And uh, as much as, as some may think we were a little off topic today, I think it was right on cue for where it needed to be and why. And it's, for me, one more step in my quest to end the silence, the stigma, and the shame. Yeah. I thank you so much, Allison, uh, for coming on and uh, really giving so much of yourself i appreciate that thank you if you had one if you had one thing to offer the audience one thing that you think is a useful tip or a little tool that they can put in their own toolbox what would that be um Practicing radical acceptance, I think, is a really big thing. Accepting, radically accepting, this is where, you know what, right now I am feeling really sad and that is okay. And maybe I always tell clients, even with suicide, let's even do it suicidal thoughts, like having suicidal thoughts right now. I tell clients sometimes, I'm like, push it off till tomorrow, wake up tomorrow and see how you feel. And you may feel differently in the morning. And a lot of times people wake up in the morning, next morning, they go, oh, I'm actually like this feels, I feel a little better or this feels a little different or it's just not as strong. And it's just like accepting where we are is the only way we can make change and um, find hope and an opportunity for something to be just a little bit different, which I love. That's wonderful. Cause you, you walked right into something that I've been doing for a very long time. You know, when you take a nap or go to bed and go to sleep, those first 10 to 15 seconds when you wake up, you're a blank slate. You can write anything on that slate. You have yeah. the opportunity 
to start that next day or hour or whatever it is in the way that you choose. So like you, I always say, yeah, just go take a nap or go to sleep. You can choose to make it look better after. Yep. And it's 67 years later and I'm still here. So it must work. It must work a little. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, well, it was great chatting with you. It was so great chatting. It was and I'm wonderful so chatting with you. Yeah. What a great platform this is too and podcast. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I, I really appreciate that. I want to say thank you to our audience. And I look forward to seeing you again next time. In the meantime, make the very best of your today every day. And we'll see you again soon. Oh, things are falling apart here. That's so strange. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite service. Suicide Zen Forgiveness was brought to you by Truel Social Media, the digital integration specialists. Let them get you on page one in the search results. And also by Canada's keynote humorist, Judy Kroon, the motivational speaker, comedian, author, and stand-up coach at Second City. On the stage, Judy draws from her wealth of performance experience, wit, and insight to entertain, inform, and inspire in her dynamic keynotes and half-day workshops.